Welcome back to the BJJ Fanatics podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Ford. My guest today is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He also holds a black belt in Judo. He's one of the longest running students of Professor John Danaher, and he's been teaching in Brooklyn, New York for over 18 years. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to be joined today for the second time on the podcast by Professor Brian Glick. How are you today, Brian? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. Of course, Brian. It's always a pleasure to get to pick your brain and talk with you. I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here. Uh, It's been almost a year, I think about nine or 10 months since I had you on the show last. What what have you been up to since uh, about June of last year? Oh, I mean, uh, a lot of the same stuff. You know, I think that um, training, teaching, I've been doing a little bit of traveling and spending a lot of time lately doing a little more judo. So I'm still kind of like digging into the the practice and the training and all that stuff and finding stuff new things we were in um las vegas back in uh, august with the great uh, rby roman bravo young who um you know is a of course very decorated collegiate wrestler and um but he was on um UFC Fight Pass, he had a nice kind of exhibition style fight, first foray into like jujitsu style rules, a modified rule set. Um, fought a very talented, uh, lightweight out of the UFC, whose name, of course, I can't remember right now, but uh, it was a great fight. So, but that was very exciting. You know, we had a full training camp and, um, you know, being a part of something where you have someone who's just so incredibly talented, even if it's not in jujitsu, it's in, you know, in grappling. And then being, on the ground floor of that and and just the excitement and the energy that was really amazing um he's now in the process of qualifying for the olympics so you know that's that's his next thing but then i know that once that cycle is complete he's going to be heading back into jiu-jitsu and mma so that's going to be that's going to be something for us to look forward to um beyond that you know i'm just trying to really stay on top of my own training that's always been something that my instructor uh, emphasized was you know consistency and really you know even even when you don't have a lot of uh, peak times in the course of the year in the course of the month to just have that steady drip 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 of training so I'm always I'm always trying to stay on the mat as much as I can stay injury free and then um, you know I, I also you know I really believe and I think you know this is again from him that you know one of the best ways to learn is to teach so as much as I can be te- teaching I'm trying to do that. Um, and the people out here in, in Brooklyn are just, uh, you know, super, super apt and great students. So I've been enjoying teaching and training and just trying to stay, trying to stay up on everything because, you know, there's so much going on with jujitsu these days. Um, so much information, so many competitions, so many people, um, you, you know, so, so many new personalities, so many new techniques, so many new things coming up and, it's a lot different than it was when I first started. So it's a fun challenge to be able to try to stay on the crest of the wave, you know, and not get smashed down into the, into the bottom of the ocean. So it's been a good time. That's outstanding. Well, obviously your students in Brooklyn are all very lucky. They're in a very good position with a great instructor. So that's really cool that you're really pouring yourself into their, into their development. And uh, you, Brian, that kind of leads me to, I'd like to kick things off with you here with your thoughts on something kind of around instruction and coaching particular personality types. Recently, your instructor, John Danaher, was asked about the difference between how two of his students, Gordon Ryan and Nicholas Muragali, learn and adapt their jujitsu. And he said that Gordon approaches his jujitsu like a mathematician. Everything is like step by step. While Muragali um, is has more of an artistic approach like he tends to think more intuitively Mm. rather than algorithmically and at the end of the day they both have the same result they're at the top of the heap of the world of jiu-jitsu and I've always been deeply fascinated by the way different people process and and express their art of jiu-jitsu based on their specific attributes both mental and physical and I I remember in one of my old notebooks from way back when um, I I scribbled down the idea of artists and engineers which is basically the idea that some people I've met in jiu-jitsu are more artistic and creative and kind of adapt to things in the moment intuitively, while others are more like systematic and almost operate like a computer program with well-defined protocols to address different variables that happen in a role, uh, which is very much in line with what John was describing with Gordon and Miragali. Now, you're, you're an, a very experienced teacher. How do you approach these two different types of students differently to ensure that they're both absorbing the lesson well and grow their game moving forward? You know, when I was coming up as a student, and I think that one of the things that was very um, appealing about uh, Mr. Danaher's approach, and I think it's one of the things that's really resonated 
with people in terms of, uh, you know, his online, his, his, you know, his students who are maybe not in the room with him, the people who are watching the videos, is that it, it has a step-by-step -step quality to it that allows you to kind of move through very systematically. You know, that's like kind of the defining feature of his approach. And when I first started, the reason that that was so attractive was that I didn't really feel like I had much in the way of athleticism or in the way of like a natural intuition about grappling. I wasn't an athlete. Um, I didn't play sports. I wasn't really drawn to that sort of thing in high school or college or recreationally. So having someone who could outline exactly what the plan was, what the program was, it, it cleared out a lot of, um, I think stress and anxiety around like how, like what are you supposed to do? Because, you know, if you ask anybody who is a white belt, and they're just getting, or someone who's just getting started, it's like, it's very chaotic. You know, jujitsu is very chaotic, even if it is systematized. And so I think that there are going to be people who are naturally um, predisposed to understanding how the body moves and understanding how things connect. This is true in a lot of fields. You know, there, there are people who, um, I feel like in the visual arts, there are people who, you know, they pick up a paintbrush and it just, it seems like they have a natural eye for uh, distance and, you know, proportion and things like that. And um, when you find somebody like that, it's really like, it's very, I think it's rare, you know, it's pretty rare. And it's also, it's very hard to construct or create that with someone who isn't that intuitive or isn't that like naturally gifted. So the question then becomes, well, like, what do we do with everybody else? And as a teacher, what I think, and I, again, I kind of go back to my own experience with this and I try to draw on like, his approach with me and then I tried to just, you know, draw out the things that were most effective about that and like share that, which I think is, you know, when you are a teacher who had a great teacher, I think that that's part of your job. I try to think about like, okay, well, we need to have a way of transmitting this stuff so that basically anybody can get it. And to me, this kind of more systematic approach where maybe it's not because we don't want it to be too rigid because, you know, Ryan, as you know, when you're training, it's not even if you're being systematic and you're going algorithmically and step by step, it's a, it's a rough and tumble process. I mean, you know, like someone's got their hand in your face and like they're in front of you and then they're all of a sudden they're behind you. So like trying to figure out it's so fluid, it's very difficult to kind of track um, completely system. I control the system once like e each step of the way. So you do need to have some intuition, but I think that if you have a plan and you can articulate what those steps are, you're going to be able to reach even the people who lack a natural intuition or, or lack a kind of more creative approach. Um, and then I think, all, you know, related to that, you can take someone who is able to learn these steps and give them the confidence in those steps to be very fluid and free and intuitive and make real time decisions. So kind of back to my analogy of, you know, it's kind of like having an, an you know, someone who is a natural artist, you the natural, the person who has a natural gift, a natural talent, my belief is they'll benefit from kind of taming and aiming that, uh, that energy and that effort through a more systematic analytical approach. It's a way of giving guardrails to like, you know, a Ferrari, you know, it's like the Ferrari is going to, it's going to benefit a little bit from knowing where the road is. And if you can put up a few guardrails, then that's great. You don't need to like put everything in a tunnel, but you want to have some guardrails. 
Um, and then if you have a car that's not as nice as a Ferrari that doesn't handle as smoothly or isn't quite as fast, that car is also going to benefit from having some guardrails. It needs it even more. So I think when you're teaching a classroom full of people, you're always going to have some who are head and shoulders above the rest. Um, size, strength, athleticism, power, flexibility, those kind of attributes. And so for those folks, your approach, if you have a more systematic approach, they're going to glom onto that faster and they're going to be able to use that stuff as like a vehicle for their natural abilities. The people who are not will also be able to use that as a vehicle. They may not go as, as far, they may not go there as quickly, um, but they are going to get some benefit. And I think if you go the other way, if you're teaching only in an intuitive way, if you're teaching only in a kind of creative way, without constraints, without a sense of, again, system or direction, I think you're going to lose a lot of people. You know, it becomes like kind of difficult to follow. So, you know, that, that's my opinion. You know, I've always felt like it's, it's easier for me and I think easier for a lot of people to learn when they're given an outline of what's expected. It's harder, in spite of the fact that I think a lot of people want to have freedom, I think it's harder to have too much freedom uh, because there are just too many choices. I'm not like, I'm not anti-choice, but I'm also like, I don't know if you need so many choices. Sometimes I like to have fewer choices that are higher percentage. If that makes sense. It, it absolutely does. Well, you know, in, in an art that's as dynamic as jujitsu with so many moving parts and so many different systems that connect together, if you just send a new person out there and say, okay, start exploring, it's kind of like, they, like you said, they have no roadmap. They don't know where to start. So I, I agree with you hundred percent. You've got to have some, especially in the fundamental classes, some really solid structure and a guideline on where yeah. uh, you know, a trajectory yeah. for them to be moving along. You, you know, some, yeah. some, something, yeah. you said, something you said there, I'd like to zoom in on. Um, there's been a lot of discussion among different guests I've had on the show over the years about whether or not natural talent actually exists in jiu-jitsu. Uh, there, there's some people that think that some people are just athletic but don't necessarily have the natural aptitude to, to learn the, 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 the intricacies of jiu-jitsu as fast as someone that's maybe not as athletic but super smart. What are your thoughts on that? What, what, how, how significant is talent in jiu-jitsu and what do you consider to be natural talent in, uh, in jiu-jitsu? I mean, natural talent, it definitely exists. You know, I think the question is, um, like does, you know, when we talk about traditional athletic qualities, are though, are, you know, the way that we think about people who are people who excel in professional basketball or professional football or professional tennis, you know, those sorts of things, you know, do those qualities translate directly into jujitsu? And uh, I think, you know, jujitsu is such a technical art that, Athleticism definitely helps, um, but you also have to understand how to deploy it. You know, I'm not a golfer, but you know, golf, it's like the way you generate power through a swing is not just by having bigger muscles. You know, it's it, like there is a sense in which you have to really train the muscles that you have to work in, in conjunction with each other to produce the result that you want. To have so you know you want the ball to be able to go as far as it can go at the you know in the beginning of the golf game or whatever and then like as you get closer and you're putting you know you're not driving anymore you don't need as much power so you need to be able to recruit the same muscles to do a different job so i think that when people talk about having like natural athleticism or natural talent in jujitsu it's like yeah, it exists, but I think it looks different than, um, you know, in, in some other fields. And usually, you know, people are drawing on these other fields to try to understand what's going on. You can have people be incredibly successful in jujitsu without having natural athletic talent or ability. And I, you know, I don't think that I've been like incredibly successful necessarily in jujitsu. I think that I've, I've been able to kind of like figure some stuff out. And I think I had I was lucky enough to have a great teacher and a lot of really, really great, talented, um, very athletic training partners around me. But like, you know, I think the reason that I found jujitsu to be so rewarding was because I didn't need to have some of those classic 
uh, athletic qualities in order to be successful in a very physical endeavor. Um, so it's, it is true that I think there are certain things that make you more apt to success, to be successful in jujitsu. And like you were saying, Ryan, I think having uh, a particular temperament does help, you know, being too, and we've seen like, you know, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head, but I'm sure you can. And you know, the, the listeners can, there are plenty of people over the years who have been like explosive or uh, aggressive or like good fighters or irritable or whatever. And they have these kind of qualities that you would think would make them ideally suited for like a jujitsu, you know, to win, win a championship, but they end up kind of getting in their own way. Like they get, you know, there's no way that there's no, again, kind of going back to what we were saying before, there are no kind of guardrails on those, those natural, um, kind of abilities or these, these natural qualities. And so, yeah, you end up with someone who is like really strong, but doesn't know how to use it or someone who's really explosive and it ends up getting in their way or they're really dynamic, but they don't know when to slow down. And good jujitsu is really about being able to like adapt and then like adopt the proper strategy at the proper time in the proper way. And I was having a conversation, actually I was having a conversation with um, Gary Tonin about this the other day. And we were saying, you know, like he's a guy who, I mean, he wasn't saying this about himself. I was saying this about him, but he's a guy who can a a adapt in the middle of a fight if the circumstances require him to do something different. So he can stand up if he needs to stand up. He can roll into the legs if he needs to roll into the legs. He can play defensively if he needs to. And there are just not a lot of people that can do that. You know, like that's a, and that to me is like a super skill. It's not just about his flexibility or his size or even his experience. It's just a combination of those things. And um, there are plenty of people who you would look at them and you'd be like, oh, this guy. I mean, like, I remember when Gary fought uh, Paul, you know, people are like, this is insane. Like, look at Husamar Paul Harris and you're like, this guy is going to destroy this little kind of scrappy, lighter guy. And on paper, you'd be right, you know, and it just didn't go that way. So the beauty of jujitsu is that there is natural athletic talent, but it looks very different. You know, it does require this adaptability, your ability to make good decisions, your ability to improvise, your ability to understand and not just memorize, your ability to train well, you know, a person who trains is going to beat someone who doesn't train. So if you're like, if you've never, and you see this again, like you, anytime someone puts out a video that's like jujitsu black belt versus, you know, NFL linebacker, everybody's like, oh, but you got a guy who's never, never trained before just because he's big and strong doesn't mean he's going to do well in this domain, you know? And we also see, again, Marigali is a, is a kind of counter example but you see a lot of people who are really good gi, not really great no gi, or vice versa. And um, so, yeah, like while there are, I think, natural skills that people can have and like attributes that make a difference, there's a lot more in jujitsu that can be learned that will contribute to your success in the long run than I think in the NFL, if you're below a certain threshold of athletic ability, you're just, you're just not breaking through, you know, you're just, they're just, you're not in it. You know, you can be super smart, uh, but if you can't run fast or, you know, catch a ball, like we, they don't really have any use for you. And jujitsu is just not really like that. 
Yeah. Well, well, thankfully, because I think a lot of people that come into jujitsu feel yeah. feel that they're not talented naturally. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's one of, it's one of the great endeavors that people can find is is because it really is a way to through merit and through hard work and some consistency you can become so much more than you would have been otherwise. And yeah. yeah, man. And I think this is like why you know the Gracies. I think this is like the root of the Gracies genius in many ways. Is that, and it's, you know, I think that during Hodger's peak era, it was very easy to forget this. And even now, because the Gracies now are so much bigger than they used to be. But the, the previous generation was really, they were a bunch of small guys. And so, uh, you know, when I began jujitsu, part of the reason was, the appeal was, these were small smaller guys. I mean, even Henzo, you know, when I first started training, like, you know, Henzo was like 5'10", 155. You know, Hoyler was even smaller. You know, you had like Hickson, who of course is like this kind of, you know, like chiseled God, you know, and at the time everybody was just like that guy, you know, like no one can stop him. But really like Elio, Carlos, you know, Henzo, Hoyler, like a lot, all of these guys, you know, were very small, unimposing people. And the root of everything that we do comes out of a bunch of people who should not really have been able to be successful coming in to the martial arts world and to like the world of like, you know, boxing and judo and wrestling and being in sambo going, you know, I like our chances. And people are like, I don't know. You guys don't look like much. And they're like, no, nah, you know, I think we, I think we got something that might work. So exactly. Like that's the thing about it. That's why, that's why we love it so much because, you know, where would we be? You know, I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't ever going to be like a wrestler. You know, I wasn't probably ever going to be like a really, you know, boxer, you know, really good boxer, I don't think so. For the people out there that consider, consider themselves to be untalented, you know, they're often told to just keep showing up and that their persistence will eventually allow them to get better. Um, in your opinion, is it more than just showing up, though, at the end of the day? And, and if so, what extra effort should be the standard practice for a student who's only getting better in really little chunks? Yeah, I think that there's a balance there because there, there is a way in which I think for people who are practicing jujitsu, especially if it's, I don't really like the word hobbyist. I think, I know people use it. I, I think it's, um, there's nothing like wrong with it exactly, but I always think when people say it that like I'm, like someone who's a hobbyist is like working on like a model airplane or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, but may maybe that's me. I feel like it's a little too um, like dismissive because people who do jujitsu, like if you talk to people who do jujitsu, who may in fact call themselves hobbyists, it's like a lot of those people are very dedicated. I mean, this, and I'm talking about people who are probably listening to this, you know, you're not not dedicated just because you're not able to do two classes a day, five days a week, or you're not a professional athlete. Like, if you have, if you're a person who has 12 free hours in the week, you know, between your job and your family and your other responsibilities and whatever else, and 10 of those 12 hours that you have free, you're doing jujitsu, like percentage wise, you're probably doing more with your, like more jujitsu with your free time than a lot of so-called professional jujitsu people. And I think that when we say, you know, oh, like these, these people are not as dedicated or, you know, we don't take them as seriously, you know, okay, it's not going to be as fun to watch them on flow grappling. You know, it's like, they're not, they're not entertainers, but, yeah. but in terms of actually practicing, like there are a ton of people out there who are really dedicated in as much, with as much dedication as they can have. And sometimes, and I, again, like even people who are pros in my experience, like the guys who I've trained with, sometimes just showing up is a huge, is like you win the battle just by showing up, you know? And I don't think, I think the problem is that people get, uh, 
you know, you get people who are like looking at that as being like a super low bar and it's like, okay, like a guaranteed path to mediocrity is being satisfied with just showing up. Well, I'm not in favor of anybody being satisfied with just showing up. But I think that unless and until you do just show up, you're not going to be able to do any of the other stuff. And so the bigger hurdle is people sitting at home going like, you know, I just don't feel like I can give 100% today. So instead of going in and getting my ass kicked, I'm going to stay home and watch TV. And it's like, no, you should get go in and get your ass kicked. Like there's nothing that there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's something wrong with that if you are accepting it as like the state of affairs for you for the rest of your life and you're not going to do anything about it. But if it's between someone going like, you know, I don't want to go in because I don't want to look bad or I don't want to have a bad class or it's too difficult or I'm tired. Like, no, like you should be, you should be getting off the couch and going in and training. Um, so I, you know, I think that if that make, if that makes sense, it's like, if you never show up, you won't get good. Uh, and the people who are good, a lot of times they are also in the same boat as you. They just have to show up even if they don't want to. Training sucks sometimes, man. You know, like talk to someone who's in a fight camp, like week, you know, week five out of eight weeks. And like, they're going to be like, oh, when I got to do this again, injured, tired, cutting weight, like it's not a fun thing. So, you know, that's my take on that. And I think I'll add one more piece to this, Ryan, which is that um, you have to, I think for, for everybody, regardless of their, their skill level or where they are in their training, you know, you have to really apply yourself when you are there, you know, like just showing up and like just being on the mat, like it doesn't guarantee that you're going to improve. And so you need to get some, you need to funnel whatever energy and effort you have into the work that you're doing. One of the places that people look at this and kind of like point fingers about it is in like uchikomis, right? So in traditional judo practice, you would do fit-ins, you would do uchikomi. In other words, you would repeat the same technique over and over again. And this is everybody who has operate, has worked in judo at a very high level. It's one of the main pedagogical methods in judo classically. I think some of that is changing because it's adapting to a more fluid, modern approach, but it's still at the core of learning. You have to do the same technique again and again. And there is some, I think, merit to training that way. I, again, like I also feel like this idea of like what people are now calling like dead drilling, uh, where you're just kind of like doing the, the technique over and over again. Um, that does something, you know, it like teaches you something. Does it teach you everything? No, it doesn't teach you everything. And should you be doing anything on the mat, like mindlessly? Of course not. Whether you're doing an uchikomi or you're doing a sparring session or you're training with a black belt or you're training with a white belt, you still shouldn't be doing it mindlessly. You shouldn't be doing anything mindlessly. Um, but you do have people who over the years have done, uchi, you know, they do a thousand uchikomis and the technique doesn't improve because they're not like observing what they're doing. They're not analyzing it or looking at it or trying to change it or trying to adjust it. They're just like going through the motions. So I'm never going to be in favor of someone just going through the motions. Um, but I will say that you can get on the mat and you can drill and you can practice and you can do like do repetitive style training and it can make a difference for you. And for some people, it, it's the right way to learn, you know, for some people it's not. And then for some people, it's the right way to learn at a certain phase of their uh, evolution. You know, some people need that. And then, you know, it, it's funny, but you know, when you talk about like people hate on Uchikomis, I think, but you know, nobody hates on like boxing pad work, right. jab, cross, hook, uppercut. Yeah. 
It's like, you know, if you want to get good at boxing, you're, you're going to do jab, cross, hook, uppercut. And you're going to, it's going to be fluid as you get more comfortable with the mechanics of the strikes. It's going to get more, you're going to get more comfortable and you'll add in, you know, slips and you'll add in other sort of footwork movement and stuff like that. And then it, the, the drill kind of comes alive. But um, I know this is kind of a long answer to your, to, to your question, but the idea that we can have a situation where someone, the barrier that someone needs to step over is simply come into class, that's, that's totally fine. But once you're there, make the most of it, you know. Excellent advice. Yeah. You know, kind of on that note, I'll, I'll go back to something you were saying earlier. You were saying that, you know, on the days that you know you're just going to go in and get your ass kicked, you should still go. And for new students, that might be something that's a pretty big hurdle to overcome. They're like they might be asking the question, okay, why, why should I go in and get beat up today after I've worked a full day? I'm tired. I should go tomorrow when I feel better. What, what reasons do you think there would be to go through and, and still show up on those days when you know you're going to suffer a little? If you only think class to class or role to role, then you won't want to come in and get your ass kicked. If you don't have a vision for something beyond what you're already experiencing, then you're not going to want to do it because in the short term, it doesn't make any sense in the short term. Yeah, I'm tired. I just, I had a hard day. Why do I want to make my day harder by coming in and getting humiliated? If, however, you know, if you align your training with a broader vision, like where do you want to end up rather than where are you presently, then you're able to see what's going on in the classroom with tough training partners or you're on the bottom of the mountain or you're getting your ass kicked or whatever as a chapter in the book that you're writing. If it's just a piece of paper in a scrap, like a, in a in a notebook that doesn't have any narrative or story to it, yeah, it's like, you know, I would quit also probably. Uh, you know, in traditional martial arts and even in jujitsu to some degree, and I know there's like people debate this kind of a little bit, but you know, black belt is one way. It's not only it's the only way, but I think black belt is one way to frame out this thing. You know, are you training, are you going in so you can be the best white belt you can be? I don't think there's anybody, you know, who's in jujitsu who's like, yeah, like king of the white belts. Like that's my ultimate goal. Yeah. But you do have people who, you know, you have, you have people who are like, I want to be the best black belt I can be. Like that's worthwhile. And it might not mean that you're, you know, the best black belt you can be might still not mean that you have aspirations of winning the world or even going to the worlds or even doing any, you know, competition at all. Like there are plenty of people who are training for whom that's not a meaningful goal. And so like, that's totally fine, but you have to at least be thinking where you want to end up down the line. So part of that is, you know, we can leave that as instructors, you know, we can kind of leave that to the student to develop, you know, on their own and like hope they get it right we can kind of share that, like teach that as a, like part of the education of being a white belt or a blue belt. And then if you get that as a white belt or a blue belt, by the time you get to a purple belt, you've kind of internalized it a bit. So you're like, okay, I get it. Like a black belt comes in and sweeps me and mounts me and strangles me. It's just a bad day. You know, it's just like, there are some things that I still don't get. Not like it's a referendum on who you are as a person and like a kind of, you know, how you're, you know, whether you can do jujitsu or not. I think that that's, so part of the job of getting people and this, you know, like we're talking about it too. So hopefully people who are listening, it's like, it's kind of framing some things for them, but people who are teaching, if you're listening to this and you're an instructor, part of your job also is, how are you creating a vision for your students so that they see beyond today's failures? Because if all you see are today's failures, you're going to, you're going to throw in the towel really soon. Jiu-jitsu is uh, like an accumulation of technique and also experience and uh, decision-making and like 
problem solving and all of those things. So, you know, you can understand this in a lot of ways, but it's kind of like if I make 10 bucks and it's burning a hole in my pocket and I run out and I buy something, you know, for 10 bucks, then I'm never going to have enough money to buy something for a hundred bucks. You know, I'm still always just going to be like, ah, I never have enough money. I never have enough money. Well, the problem is the habit of spending the $10 that I have instead of saving it. So in jujitsu, it's very similar. You know, the problem is that white belts come in and instructors or their peers or the culture or, or just whatever is like, ah, oh, you suck. You know, you got arm locked, you suck. Instead of framing it and being like, yeah, you know what? Like you do suck, but you're supposed to suck now so that like you suck less later on. And we see this in other, like, again, you can probably think of people and situations like this, and I'm sure, again, people who are listening can think of this, but people who are like jujitsu practitioners who are like really high level jujitsu athletes, and they get into a bad position that they haven't trained or that they're just not comfortable with, and it's like everything melts down. It's like a total meltdown. It's like all of a sudden they're back to being a, a white belt or a blue belt. And, you know, so you can have this experience where you kind of, you never work on your weaknesses or you never look like an idiot. And as a result, you will look like an idiot. It'll just be later on. You know, you're kind of, you're postponing the inevitable. So one good way to frame this out for new people is like, hey, look like it's okay. Like now is the time to look like you don't know what you're doing because you don't know what you're doing. And, and then we hold the people who are at brown belts, black belt, or that like, you know, in no gi, you know, that level of experience, you know, you hold those people to a higher standard and you're like, well, I don't know. Like, why are you still, you know, you still don't have an answer for the arm lock. Like, I'm not saying you get caught. Like I'm saying like you don't even know what to do with it. Well, you know, we need to fix that habit. So I think that it's, it's a process. And I think that jujitsu is sometimes, and it is for me too, you know, like with people who are really good and the people who I train with, you know, these guys like Badoni and Marigali and Gary and Gordon, these guys like, I, I hope that I look like a moron sometimes with those guys, because if I don't, then it's like, I'm too playing too safe and I'm not pushing out past what I already know. And like everybody else, like, I, I mean, I don't want that feeling all the time, <laughs> but you know, you know, you need it even when you've been 20 or 25 years into the training. So yeah, that, that's a great answer. You know, it's funny, like jujitsu is one of those things, I think combat sports in general, it's interesting how new people adapt to, to, to taking losses and feeling foolish at first. Like no one starts guitar and expects to shred like like Jimi Hendrix their first day. Yeah, and right, no one, exactly. No one picks up a skateboard and thinks they're gonna drop it and skate like Tony Hawk. But there's something about being physically dominated in a combat situation or at least a simulated combat yeah. situation that stings yeah. a little extra. I don't know if it's just, uh, yeah. you know, I don't know what that is, but it, 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 it seems like people hate feeling new in jujitsu more than any other activity, I swear. Yeah, I think it's very confronting. You know, it's a, it's much more, you can't escape from it in the same way. And it's a very visceral experience. And I think that it's difficult. You know, there's no question it's difficult that when you first come into the training and someone is just mounted on you and you can't get out, it induces a feeling, a very visceral, like, uh, uh, instinctual feeling of panic and overcoming that initial panic is for a lot of people. That's the first thing, you know, that's like the first lesson in jujitsu is not panicking. And I think even when people are training for a long time, sometimes we get into modes where we're in swimming in water that is unfamiliar, you know, we're, we're, or we're on terrain that's unfamiliar. And there is a sense of panic that, that shows up because what if we can't get out? You know, what if you, what if, what if you're on the bottom of the mount and you never get out? And, or what if someone has you in a strangle and you never get out, you know, you're gonna die. So the consequences, even though we know that in the, in, in the classroom especially, but you know, even in like, 
you know, the risk level is a lot higher if you're in a tournament, but still like it's totally possible that I don't think it's probable, but I think it's possible that someone puts a stranglehold on you and the ref doesn't see it and they don't let it go and you die. It could happen. You know, that's why people have to sign waivers before they're doing all this stuff. Like rooted in something, you know, in the reptile brain and we're like very, you know, we're, we're nervous about it. So that doesn't happen usually when you're learning how to play tennis. Right. You know, when you're playing tennis, it's like the consequences are not quite as great. And then certainly if you're learning how to paint or if you're learning how to play guitar, it's like, no, if you can't play guitar, your life will go on. But if you can't get out of the mount, your life might end, you know? And I think that we are like, until you train yourself to think differently and experience things differently, you're going to have that, that, that sensitivity, that like, um, that feeling. So it's one of the reasons why, again, you know, our approach, you know, Danaher's approach is defense first, retention first. And, you know, I mean, a lot of the martial arts are like that also, you know, in karate, even in traditional karate, there's no first strike in karate. You know, it's like everything in karate, in, in, in like traditional karate begins with a block. And then you strike. It's not like you're coming forward and like striking people. It's like you're, it's a very defensive thing. So in jujitsu too, when we're teaching, we usually like to begin by teaching people how to, how to defend themselves. And the old school Gracie jujitsu stuff, you know, the kind of combative style training was all about that. And it was like, okay, first don't get punched in the face. You know, so you block and then you step in and hip throw the person or like, you know, don't get, you know, choked from the back when you're just standing there. So these defensive things, I think, point to the fact that people don't feel totally comfortable or confident until they have a sense of how to deal with uh, threats. And a big part of learning how to do jujitsu, kind of back to your question about you know, what about white belts and people who are just beginning or like, kind of feeling like they're getting their ass kicked. It's starting to have not just an intellectual understanding of like, okay, you're, you're in the bottom of the mount. You're not going to die. Probably it's that intellectual thing, but also you have to have the experience and it's why in jujitsu sparring, I think is so important. You have to have the experience of being like, um, in, swimming in that water. And when you do that, you start by panicking. And then over time, you start to learn that there are some situations that on the surface look like they're pretty dangerous, but in reality, they're not that dangerous. And over time, you're going to gain skills that are going to allow you to feel more confident in these dangerous situations. And then the threats become like less and less serious. So even if we know that it's not really, the person's not really going to, you know, kill us, they are trying to strangle us until we say stop. And that I think for a lot of people is, is a barrier. So the mental process of being able to uh, detach from your habits, like your, uh, you know, what basically is common sense to detach from that so that you can recreate a bond like between those things that makes more sense. That's the work and it's very difficult to do. And there is a big barrier for people, but we can make it easier, you know, as instructors, I think. Yeah. Well, it goes right back to what you were saying earlier about the importance of creating guardrails for people as they're, especially as they're first starting. And, you know, so students, there's a lot of students that unfortunately don't have those same guardrails when they first start somewhere. I think, I think overall the jujitsu community has done a really good job of, of being um, more rigid with, with fundamental classes and introductory classes and kind of guiding people along. But I, I'm sure you could relate to this. And I remember when I first started, it was just kind of getting thrown to the wolves that the, the instructor was just, Hey guys, right. today we're going to do this. And it, there was really no like cohesive uh, connection to, to the previous class or the next class. It's just, hey, today I'm going to teach this technique. Tomorrow I'm going to teach this one. And yesterday I taught this other thing. And you just collect these pieces and try to put them together until things started to kind of make sense. And um, 
most schools don't do that anymore, but there are still some that do. For students that are in a place where they don't feel like they have the same uh, mindful guardrails that you've put in for your students, uh, it can be overwhelming, especially today because there's so much, like I swear to students that, that trained back in the 90s would get less information in two months than students that scroll through Instagram in one day would get now. And uh, if your social media yeah. feed looks yeah. anything like mine, it's probably 99% jujitsu content. This can be overwhelming right, right. For, for new students trying to build a foundation. It, it can be distracting and even more more experienced students who have a specific area of their game that they really need to be focusing on can can get kind of pulled away if they're not careful. What what advice would you offer in regards to filtering out the noise and avoiding distractions in the process of developing their game in, in the modern world we live in now? This to me is the central question as for people who are learning jujitsu. It's not how can we gain more information or the right information even? It's how can we filter out the stuff that we don't need? And it's a broader question really, Ryan, because we have this same issue like resonates in all other, like a lot of other areas of our lives where like we do have a lot of distractions, you know? We have like the distractions on the phone and the social media stuff and like how do we, like how do we filter? And developing a filter, I think, is very difficult, honestly. I think it, it's challenging. I'll tell you my experience, um, which was even back, you know, when I first began jiu-jitsu, I felt like I didn't know, like, even though technique, like, there were some techniques that were available and I was learning, I just... I felt like I didn't really know enough to be able to, to filter for myself. You know, I, I knew, I got a sense really quickly and I think, you know, Henzo's was really good about, good for this in some ways where it was like, you went in and like, you kind of knew exactly where you stood. You know, when I showed up, like, you know, if you're getting your ass kicked, you know, you're on the bottom of the totem pole. And that's just how it is. And I think if you make that into an ego thing where you're like, you feel threatened and so you need to assert that in fact you're not at the bottom of the totem pole and like, you know, you are actually strong and you do know what you're doing, that's when you get into trouble. But if you're like, hey, you know, like this is, like you have to start where you are. If you're like, this is where I am and I would like to not stay here, then it's a ladder and you have to climb it. You know, you can't stay on the bottom rung forever. You have to be able to climb up the ladder. And so at Henzo's, it was like, you know, okay, here, like I'm starting on the bottom rung. This is where I am, you know? And like, if you're lucky, maybe you're starting on the second to bottom rung or the third to bottom rung, but you're definitely on the bottom. And so I think for, for people who are in a place where, you know, you know, I think the first, the first thing is, I think you have to really understand like, okay, look, this is where I'm at. And then, you know, for me, I was like, okay, who knows more than me here? In other words, like, if I don't want to stay where I am, like, who is, who's helped me to, to climb? And I was lucky enough to have a lot of, like, important people in those days, um, you know, uh, people who had been around, like, people who were at the time, you know, if you were, I think I said this to you before, but, like, people who were purple belts, uh, you know, back when I started training, that was like, it was as rare as a coral belt is now in jiu-jitsu. It's just like, you just, you know, if you were a purple belt, you were, you know, walking on water. And so there were a few of those guys around, these kind of old school guys, you know, Mr. Danaher was one of them. Sean Williams was another one. Um, and then eventually, you know, these guys were, it was black belts. It was uh, Ricardo Almeida, Matt Serra, you know, Rodrigo Gracie. And so I was like, okay, well, so who, who has the information and who can like help me with this stuff? And it narrowed down to being, you know, John Danaher as like, I was like, okay, this person is the person who I can, I can hear them the best. And uh, the information makes the most sense and I'm getting like a kind of comprehensive understanding of what I'm supposed to do. I couldn't do it all, but I could at least understand it. So I think the first stop for people who are training now is your instructor. Like you have to really trust the person who is your instructor 
to filter, at least provide some filtering of information to guide you in, in the right direction. And if you're in a place where, for whatever reason, you don't trust your instructor, I'm not telling every, I'm not telling anybody to leave, but I'm saying that I think it's going to be difficult if you can't rely on that person to filter information for you, because then it's a, then it's a much bigger job for you as a student. Um, I know there are plenty of people out there who are self-taught and who are kind of like autodidacts. I think that I, I can't like overstate, you know, you can probably tell, but like, I can't overstate my gratitude to, you know, Danaher because if it was not for him, I think I certainly would have, I might have continued on, but I don't, I just don't think that I would still be doing jujitsu now. I think that like, I would have petered out. Like I would have like, I don't know, I would have gotten injured or I would have like gotten frustrated or something like that. So I think that like, you know, you do need to find someone that you can trust who you can rely on. And, um, I wouldn't really want to be self-taught, even though I think that there are plenty of people out there who are and who do a great job of it. Um, and then, you know, I think the next best thing, of course, is these days it's possible for you to learn from anybody. And, you know, I mean, this is the, this is the benefit of BJJ fanatics, you know, like again, uh, 20 years ago, there were instructional videos, but they were few and far between. And they were difficult to get a hold of in many cases. And they were not as, you know, there are a lot of fanatics videos, but you can kind of narrow down um, to the instructors that you feel like really speak to you and are clear, you know, give you a clear outline. And it's not always the same person, you know, for, you know, for someone, maybe it's Gordon, for someone else, maybe it's you know, Galvao for someone else, maybe it's Musa Mechi. And it's like, you're just going to hear that person more clearly. And I think that like, once you have that, it's good to follow that person. Like, it's good to like, get your information, let them filter for you a little bit, like give, give the instructor, either your like virtual instructor or your in-person instructor, like give them a chance to guide you because you also don't want to be in a situation where, you know, you, where you end up having like a kind of um, buffet style jujitsu, you know, where you're kind of like plucking one thing from one place and one thing from another place and it doesn't really cohere, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, you want to, you want to be able to have someone who you can at least, you know, give, give them entrust them with your progress and see where they take you. And if, you know, if, if you do that for a little while and it's not working, well, then, you know, you can, you can make a change. And sometimes it's like, you know, it's like a lot of things. It may take a couple of goes to find the right fit for you. But, um, but I think that there are plenty of opportunities to be able to do that. I think the challenges, the two challenges are number one, um, if, you are trying to filter a lot of this stuff yourself and you don't have the, um, you know, you, you're serious and you don't have the kind of proper tools to be able to adjust, like to be able to, um, to filter, uh, and, or you don't give, you don't give your instructor or an instructor a chance and you end up just sampling everything. And if you do that, you're not going to have a real cohesive practice. Um, the last thing I would say is if you're in a place where you're at risk of getting injured, and I think like you were saying, Ryan, like that's less and less likely, you know, it's like, it's, it's less, of course, this is jujitsu. So there are chances and the potential to get injured and, um, and, you know, it's a contact activity, so you're going to have that. But if you can reduce the likelihood that you're going to get really injured or you're catastrophically injured or an injury that's going to set you back months, um, then that's a good idea. You know, it's good to avoid that. And anytime you're in an unsafe environment, it's going to be hard to learn. And what, one of the worst ways, one of the, one of the best ways to learn nothing is to get injured and have to be off the mat 
that makes sense. So absolutely, yeah, Brian. Let me ask you this: Do, do you think that there's a tendency in, in modern jujitsu to overcomplicate and overthink things? Obviously, like like the quality of instruction and, and the, the idea of presenting concepts and principles and things like that to students is better than ever. But at the same time, do you think it might have overcomplicated things sometimes? Uh, the worst thing that you can do is give someone too much information, you know, and. You know, my experience was that I know that, you know, people feel like sometimes I, I you know, I've, I've heard people say, you know, oh, you know, like sometimes like John is, you know, his, his videos are long or like, you know, they watch a video of his and they feel like it's like it's too complicated. And um, in the my experience has always been that it actually is the opposite, that, that it's it is very streamlined and it, in the classroom and the way that I was taught was very kind of you know, being able to be efficient in jujitsu is a great skill. And I think being able to be efficient as an instructor is also a great skill. I think it's even more, in many ways, it's as difficult to be an efficient instructor as it is to be an efficient practitioner. So yes, I think that people can allow the, uh, you know, like the tail to wag the dog a bit when it comes to systematizing things. And I know, again, and this is not to knock anybody's particular um, approach to learning or, you know, what, what, what tools people find to be helpful. If you, if you have something that you find helpful, then by all means, like, please go ahead and, and use it. And if, if it really works for you, then great, you know, different people learn differently. But, you know, I know, like, for instance, um, people have tried to make flow charts off of, you know, uh, instructional videos. And it turns into this, like, it, it's like, a, it's just a sprawling, uh, kind of endlessly, like, you know, sprawling kind of tangle of things. And, and it's just so, there's so much that it's very difficult. I, I can imagine it would be very difficult to use. So, the challenge in jiu-jitsu is not making something that's basic advanced. It's not taking something that's simple and making it complicated. The challenge and like the genius in jiu-jitsu, you know, when someone is very good at it, is taking what's very complicated and making it simple. And if you have an instructor that can do that, or you have a teacher that can do that, it can take a, a, a concept or it can, uh, they can take a technique or a set of techniques or range of, a range of positions and simplify them, then you, I mean, you, if you can find that, you've really struck gold because in practice, and ultimately what we're talking about, jujitsu is practice. It's on the mat. You know, it's like theory is one thing, but you're going to have to get out of the theoretical realm if you want to be able to train and you got to get on the mat and train. And when you're doing that, things are uneven, you know, things are variable. Like we were saying, things change and, and they get complicated and you do panic and you do get stressed out and you have all of these other things to consider. So if you're expected to remember eight moves ahead, um, you know, and you kind of built out a flow chart and you understand what every kind of scenario is supposed to look like, accessing that is not going to be that easy. You know, some people would say it's impossible. You're not going to be able to really think more than two or three steps beyond what you're doing. And that was, again, you know, like Dan, her method is like, you know, you have two or three options from each spot you're in. You don't have 10. You don't have like eight. You have two or three. And if you look at, uh, you know, again, like, you know, if you look at Gordon's jujitsu, it's he has evolved and he's constantly evolving and he's always demonstrating something new, but it's very fundamental. You know, it has a couple of core things. And of course, like the Ur example of this is Hodger. You know, Hodger only really did a couple of things. He just did them great and he dominated everybody with them. Bernardo is, by the way, I was talking about this with someone today. Bernardo is the same way. Bernardo had kind of like two, two moves that were really one move. You know, he had over under pass and then he had like deep half guard and deep half is the inverted, you know, is, is an inversion of the over under. Yeah. And he destroyed people with it. 
like amazing people. And he went to the highest levels of, you know, jujitsu competition with it. And so, you know, I think that in some ways it does not need to be very complicated. The beauty of training for a long time and the fun of it is that you get to do all of this stuff. So, you know, if you're training for 20 years, you get to do the deep half and the over under pass and the heel hooks and front headlocks and gi and no gi and judo and wrestling. Like over a long enough time period, you can have a breadth of training. But when it comes to depth, uh, you, you know, you want to go deep, but you don't want to go too deep because then it becomes very difficult to find your way out. Something you said there about Danaher's approach, you mentioned that there are a lot of people who um, who find his his content to be kind of harder to swallow. But man, for me, I, I love what you said there about how you have to find the right voice and the right people that communicate to you well. And for me, Dan, I, I love Danaher's stuff. Like for me, it feels like every time I watch one of his instructionals, yeah. I'm taking a, like a university course, you know? And I love the way that he right. takes, uh, I, I love what you said there too, about how it's not so much about taking something simple and making it uh, so complicated. It's more about taking complicated things and simplifying them down and i've always loved the way that he was able to take pretty dynamic systems and things like that and and and, and bring them into a into a framework that makes it more digestible at least to me so uh that was very well yeah. said yeah i really i really appreciated what you said Good. there uh, brian i'll tell you what we've reached about the halfway point of the show man you've done this before this is called the pummel game i play it with every guest uh some of these questions it, it's basically a series of random questions some of them are about jujitsu some of them have nothing to do with jujitsu i'm going to try to ask you different questions than i asked you last time but there may be a little bit of overlap, okay. but it's always fun because we sometimes get different answers. But if you're down to play the pummel for the second time, I'd love to play this game with you. Okay, let's do it. All right, man. Uh, let's see. Question one. What do you think is the best advice you've ever received in your life? When it comes to jujitsu, it was definitely continuing to train. You know, I think there was a moment where, you know, I, I've told this story before, but, you know, Danaher came to me and was like, don't train anymore. You know, like you think you should quit. It's not for you. But, um, you know, I think that aside from that, ultimately, like over the long, the long term, the biggest, most important lesson was about being consistent and going back to what we were saying, you know, like sometimes you are having a good day, sometimes you're having a bad day. And if you can eliminate those sorts of like ups and downs by just having a consistent habit, a consistent routine, then you're going to overcome in the long term, you know. Uh, a lot of the peaks and valleys that you experience. And when it evens out, it tends to trend upward. So that was really, really good advice. I, you know, I still use it to this day. So who's someone that you've never had the chance to roll with, but that you would love to have a training session with that you'd love to roll with? Um, man, you know, I was in the same room with uh, Kale Sanderson and he showed me a couple of different things, uh, you know, from his standing position, some grip fighting. We didn't have a chance to move around at all. And I think that would be, you know, that would be amazing, you know. Um, just, I think that with a lot of people at that, like, high level, um, just feeling what they're doing is not so much of, like, you know, going up against them as it is having a chance to experience, you know, how they, like, how they move, how they grip how they respond, you know, when you're around someone who's been doing things at a really high level for so long, there's almost like, it's not exactly osmosis, but there are certain things that you can learn just by moving around with them and being available that you can't learn just from instruction. You know, you really do have to feel it. So that was an opportunity that didn't, I was close, but it didn't, you know, it didn't happen where we were actually moving around. Um, so maybe one day. That is cool. That would be a really good one for sure. Especially anyone that wants to wants to uh, experience that on your feet, like someone that loves takedowns the way that you do. That would also be a, a really yeah. cool experience. What do you think is um, who's your favorite grappler of all time? I'm a huge fan. You know, back in the old days, and I think that since this time, there were people who, um, you know, there are people who I just I love to watch and were really inspirational to me. But there are a, a couple of people like over the years who like at specific points in my training really like light bulbs went off and one of them was someone like and this is probably like i was maybe like a blue belt um maybe blue purple belt and uh there was a guy who was doing great in the gi and he was he kind of came uh, kind of came out of nowhere did really great and then like we kind of didn't hear from him again, Margarita. Margarita was like, 
he was so it was just like effortless and he was very you know he was big but he wasn't like jacked um and the techniques that he was doing were just like i remember at that time i was like well it's like magic you know watching someone because you're like down here and this person is doing stuff by you know by the standards by today's standards it's like you know like in terms of technique these are things that have kind of since become standard parts of jujitsu but at the time it was like really eye-opening and i remember watching like a few of margarita's fights when he was like kind of coming up to you know like beat a couple of like really great people like maybe beat solo and he beat um he beat uh flavio almeida and it was just like in a lot of those fights the other thing is a lot of those fights he was losing like uh, like on the scorecard he was losing until at the end he kind of pulled it out and he swept or he finished the guy and so that was like a you know in terms of like it's hard to say who's like your favorite fighter of all time but that was definitely a period of time where I saw that and I was like, oh, this is like really something to like aspire to. And it was it was just that that sense of kind of like being effortless. And Margarita was one of my one of my favorites. In fact, it's funny. You were talking earlier about how back before BJJ Fanatics, uh, instructionals were few and far between. You have to find them on DVDs or if you go even further back on yeah, the VHS yeah. tape. I think the first instructional I ever had was Margarita's. He had a uh, he had a, a really good instructional back in the day on DVD and um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know whatever happened to him. He kind of he kind of disappeared, but he was man, he was outstanding yeah. during the time. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, like these guys I think from that time it was it, it's hard to keep track of them because, you know, it was like an earlier generation people weren't tracking their movements, you know, the way they are now with social media. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Uh what, what do you think is your biggest phobia? Um you know, I I don't I try not to have too many phobias. Uh, I think that I'm, I'm not, I'm not a phobic person in that way where I have like fear of heights or fear of flying or fear of you know, diving. I don't know. I've never gone scuba diving. And I imagine that like, if I went scuba diving and I, I don't know, I don't like the idea of being <laughs> so far underwater and only having like a little tank of air to breathe. And, um, <laughs> You know, maybe that's just a consequence of, you know, being, you know, being strangled or choked over the years so many times that that's like I'm particularly sensitive to it. But, you know, I'm in no real rush to go so diving, um, but I'm not really afraid of it. You know, again, I think that I think one of the things that jujitsu um, is is good for and, I know, you know, good for it's not like a tool like in this way. But, you know, like I was saying to you before, it's like it's very confronting. And so you have to, in order to do well, you have to overcome some of these fears and anxieties that you, that you have as a person, you know, like you're afraid of having someone on your back or, you know, even for people who've been training for a long time, you know, you're afraid of getting heel looked, you know, so you have these fears that are embedded. And I think one of the consequences of that is you stop being like, I mean, I don't know how people feel about this. Like, I, I think I try, I'm much more conscious about being like just blindly afraid of things without understanding what and why. And, um, you know, for that reason, I think I was never like afraid of heights. Like I was saying, afraid of heights or afraid of crowds or afraid of spiders. Um, so thankfully, I, you know, I'll, I'll give jujitsu credit for making me not a particularly phobic person i might have other kind of neuroses but pho phobias i'm not in i'm not That's in that one well, what do you think is uh, your prized possession um you know i don't really consider it a possession but i do think that for a lot of people who have gotten to black belt you know that's a really significant thing um and obviously it's much more than uh you know the the you know, the strip of fabric that you wear around your waist to hold your gi closed. Um, but, it, you know, that, that was something that, you know, it was a day that was unlike any other day in my life. And I think for probably for, you know, for you, for like people who are like people, like when you graduate, 
even if you just graduate to from white belt to blue belt, like that experience for a lot of people is unlike anything else they've done. You know, even if you graduated from high school or graduated from college, it's not really the same thing. And, um, you know, again, I don't, I don't really think of it as a possession in that way because, you know, if someone took it, you know, if it got burnt, you know, if I had a fire in my house and it burned, you know, my black belt got burned, it's like, you know, I guess I'll get another one. But um, it, it uh, you know, in terms of like something that was like a symbolic um, moment and then also like a representation of so much of my relationship with Henzo, my relationship with Danaher, uh, the work and effort that you put in. I think, you know, people who are listening to this will understand that. So I would say of, of all of the stuff that I have, you know, that's the thing that I would probably, you know, I don't want to lose it. You know, if I have a choice, I don't want to leave it on the subway, you know, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave some other stuff on the subway, but I kind of don't want to leave my black belt on the subway. That's a great answer. Good answer. Uh, Brian, this is a new question that I'm debuting for the first time. What's the largest animal okay. that you think you could beat hand to hand? I mean, I'm, I'm going to say I, I, I'm not the right guy for that. Like there are you know, there are dogs and cats that I probably couldn't handle. You know, I'm not, uh, I don't have a phobia around animals, but, um, you know, wrestling other species, I, I've got my hands full wrestling this species. So, you know, I'm going to stick with that. But you're you know. doing, you're doing pretty good, man. I think, I think, I think most house cats are, yeah, yeah. are, are small dogs would be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. My claws are not that sharp. You know, my teeth are not that sharp. So, they have a leg up. Yeah, That's you know. right. uh, if you found a genie and you could have three wishes, what three wishes would you choose? Uh, you know, I, I don't know, man. I mean, I think that like, they, you know, you have to be careful of what you wish for. Right. I, one of the things about, and again, I don't bring everything back to jujitsu, but like, because it's kind of this, like our topic here, um, things, You'd never know how things are going to work out. You know, you, re you really don't. And so I think that in, the, in other times in my life, I think that I was a little more goal oriented um, and like a little more, you know, like, and it's not exactly like wishes coming true, but like, you know, having things that I wanted to have happen a certain way. And oftentimes I think the stuff that you really want to have turn out a certain way even if you get what you want, it's often not exactly the way that you thought it was going to be. So, you know, for instance, um, you know, when I was, you know, in 2021, uh, you know, Danaher and the guys moved from New York to Puerto Rico. And that for me was really difficult. You know, it was like a difficult thing. It was a difficult time. You know, of course, we we're in the pandemic and, you know, New York was a pretty tough place to be. And, um, you know, it was a lot of regulation, a lot of difficult stuff and kind of some existential uncertainty about, you know, would would we be able to do jujitsu again? And, and, you know, like would a school, you know, the schools and like the, the gyms, like would they open up again and all that stuff. And, um, you know, so he and I talked about, you know, he, you know, he he had said he was going to be, you know, relocating and the guys are going to be re relocating. And that was really like a nexus of, um, you know, that was like my jujitsu nexus was that, you know, like my friends, my instructor, my peers, like all of the years and, and all of the time we spent together. And, you know, those guys, you know, they were doing the thing that they needed to do. And that was, you know, it was good. And, and at the time I think, you know, I, I was like, you know, uh, not, you know, I wasn't like frustrated necessarily because there was a lot of other stuff going on, but, you know, I do think in, in retrospect, it's like, if I had looked at that on paper, I would have been like, like, so if you had told me five years before that that was going to happen, I would have been like, that's going to be a total disaster. Like my life is going to be over jujitsu. Like, I'm like, how am I going to, you know, how can I live without, you know, really being able to like you know, 
be around my, you know, the, the, this, this core group of people and, and people that I rely on to train and like my, you know, jujitsu information, evolution, my instructor, like, you know, again, you know, he's, you know, one of the most important, important people in my life. Um, but you know, like since the, since then, there are a lot of things that have changed for the better related to that. You know, I think that if, if that had never happened and those guys had stayed, I think there are some things that would have, would have been a lot easier for me and they it would have been a lot better. And, you know, my training certainly wouldn't have been as interrupted or I wouldn't have had to kind of create a new way of approaching it or like, you know, redefining my relationship to, you know, you know, to, to, to Danaher and like my, my peers and friends and all that stuff. But actually having to do that was very, you know, it's been very uh, important in a lot of ways, you know, like we're not as a practitioner. And again, you can relate to this as someone who's been training for a long time, like your practice is fluid. And there are times where things need to change, even if you are not the person who wants them to change and you're not going to go proactively into that. So I think like you just don't know. I would say that my relationship now with uh, Danaher is even better than it was, you know, three or four years ago. And it's moved into a different phase and it's been exactly the way that I've needed it. My relationship with you know, all of the guys has changed in many ways. It's improved because we have now, yes, more distance between us, but as a consequence, that's required like a little more effort to stay looped in. You know, sometimes when someone's around all the time, you kind of take for granted that, you know, you see them all the time and things just are how they are. So you don't pay as much attention. So like, I'm kind of careful about what I wish for these days um, because you just don't know how things are going to turn out. People who were people who were friends become, you know, not friends and people who were not friends become friends and people who were, you know, people who you didn't know now, you know, and so that's kind of my take on it. You know, it's like, I don't really, I don't really have, have too many wishes these days or, or even like goals in a hard and fast sense. Um, it's a long answer to your question. That was, it was, a, it was a, that was a very powerful answer, though. I really like that. Yeah, it's very, very, very well thought out. I like it. I like it. Uh, final question for the pummel game, Brian. Uh, if a zombie apocalypse breaks out right now in Brooklyn, what's the first thing you do? I mean, I feel like it's already broken out. I'm just going to hole up in a juju. In, I'm going to hole up on the mats and uh, you know find a couple of people who I think are not infected, and uh, you know, like we'll. Live in the basement of the dojo and we'll figure it all out. You know, I, I mean, I don't know. I think like if you look around, you know, New York City has been, you know, there have been zombies in New York for a long time. So, <laughs> uh, you know, we're just kind of we're kind of used to it, you know. It's a, it's a Tuesday in Brooklyn, baby. That's all it is. Yeah, yeah man. It's just, that's it. That's it. It's just, that's just how it is. They're walking around right now. You know, we just, this is just, this is just what we do. Oh, that's outstanding. And Brian, that's the uh, second time you've won the pummel game. Congratulations. You win. You got oh, your good. double underhooks. <laughs> Great. Brian, uh, Perfect. I, I would love to ask you for, for the technical side of our conversation here. Um, I'd love to focus on, on a position that you're really known for, which is the sumigeishi, commonly referred to as the butterfly guard. Uh, obviously a really effective yep. position from the bottom for many reasons. One reason I always like the butterfly guard personally is that it both keeps me safe from leg locks due to having the inside position, and it also allows me to enter into leg attacks pretty easily. I have to ask, being a student of John Danaher, is that the reason why you gravitated towards that position, you think? Because you came up in a room with some of the most dangerous leg lockers in the world. Yeah. You know, inside position is really the rule of thumb for us when we're playing guard. You know, the John system has always been really um, heavy on inside position. So when you're playing um, a, any kind of open guard, you know, especially seated guard, having your legs in a position where it's very difficult to get leg locked is always a plus. And, um, you know, working out of butterfly guard, you know, that was, that was a very important thing. You know, when we were playing, um, you know, if you're playing close guard or if you're playing like a kind of knee shield half guard, your legs are, you know, it's possible for someone to, to go after them. But when, when you're getting inside underneath someone, not only are you safe from getting leg lock, but you have a lot of really good entries. So that was a huge thing. Like to me, 
what I, you know, what I try, you know, what I'm trying to do is, you know, I'm trying to share, especially these days, like I'm trying to share with people some of the core elements that I learned over the years that like, you know, like we were talking about like kind of filtering stuff, like some of the like absolute essentials for like what I think someone who's training now needs in order to provide a good floor for them to stand on to do more stuff. And Sumigeshi is like, you have to be really good at it. If you want to be good at getting inside underneath people, if you want to be getting into leg locks, if you want to be able to understand how to off balance people, um, it just, it never goes out of style. And, you know, for me, some of it is exactly like you're saying, like it's the versatility, you know, the Sumigeshi can be used from a lot. Like you don't need a particular grip in, in, um, in this, the, the instructional that we just did, we focused on like three basic upper body grips, but you don't need any particular setup. And I think one thing that can be difficult for people is if you're having to funnel somebody into one particular narrow box, like narrow, like tunnel of activity, because like we were saying, it can be very chaotic, you know, things can be very difficult. So like being able to um, have a sense of like versatility, anytime your partner's on their knees, if your feet are on the inside, you're going to have an opportunity to, uh, to use sumigeshi. The other thing is that as Danaher taught, you know, sumi over the years, it really is like a hub of activity. It's a hub, not just of sweeping. And I think when most people think about like the butterfly sweep, they're thinking of it as, you know, sumigeshi as a sweep, you're tilting your partner, you're using an elevator hook, you're knocking them down, you're landing top so that you can get on top and start to pass. But, you know, over the years, like we, the way that it was taught to me was really as a like kind of a dilemma machine where you would kind of start it. And then if you swept, then great. If you didn't, you would always get a limb extended. And you would get a leg extended and you would go into leg locks or you would get an arm posted and you would gather that up and you would go into pinch head locks or, you know, uh, Udigatames. So it was a way of generating movement and motion and off balance that was, again, it was really versatile. It was pretty easy to enter. And then you could do it from like a lot of different situations. In that way, it's like even when you fail, so a lot of sweeps, when you do them, if they fail, they leave you in bad positions or you're exposed or um, you have to reset or it leaves you vulnerable to getting passed or gets getting submitted. You know, you kind of leave stuff out there. Sumigeshi is like a technique where even when you fail, you have some other element that is waiting for you. So it, even when it fails, it succeeds. You know, you're either creating limb, you're either creating a reversal, right? Which is kind of the goal of all sweeps, or you're creating some kind of limb extension. The person, like I was saying, person's posting, putting their hands on the floor and you're getting their arms extended or they're extending their legs and you're able to enter into Ashigarami and other leg attacks. And because it's creating this situation where there's always something happening, when I first started learning it, it was like, if you have a real, um, even if you don't have too many situation like even if you only have two or three options you know you can play sumigeshi as a system that will allow you to attack over and over and over again and it's one of the reasons it, you know dan her emphasized it uh, uh, over the years and it, it played such a big role and you know if you watch gordon uh, if you watch gary if you watch giancarlo if you watch any of the guys like they're still using it you know it's like still it has not gone to style um and you know, even before then, you had people, you, you know, Mo was known for his uh, butterfly sweep, his sumigeshi used at the highest level. So it's kind of one of these things that it's simple enough for anybody to use, but it's high enough level that even the best guys are still using it. So uh, to me, that's a pretty ringing endorsement, you, you know, something that you really want to be learning. So 
Absolutely, yeah. Well, I, I love what you said there about the butterfly, about the butterfly position of it being a hub, like a hub position. And that's, I think that's probably how I personally use it the most. I think it's 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 my starting point to where I branch off into my single leg X guard or my my X guard or right. you know to take the back, use arm drags. It, it, it's a great place to start. To it's it's basically a very diverse roadmap. There's a lot of places you can go with it. Yeah. Um, you were saying that uh, it, it's also a great position for beginners and advanced practitioners. What do you think are the, is the biggest beginner concept? you teach new people to it and what's your favorite advanced concept to teach more advanced people so for beginners i think it's just important to understand your posture when you're starting to use the sweep and a lot of people when they think about posture they think about posture in terms of like upright posture like you're standing or like you're in the closed guard and you have to posture up but one thing that my instructor taught very early on was this idea that for every position top and bottom, there's a posture. Like there's a placement of your body relative to your partners that you need to understand so that you can be athletic, like ready to move out of that position. And so for people who are just beginning, I think if you want to learn how to be in a seated position, whether someone's on their knees or they're standing, learning how to engage someone with, again, these kind of fundamental grips in the proper posture, it's going to help you with your guard retention. It's going to help you with your ability to sweep your partner and start to enter into other sorts of submission attacks. You know, um, The other thing is that I think when you're learning sumigashi, and it's one of the reasons why it's such a core, uh, uh, core skill, is that it teaches you a lot about this push-pull dynamic in jiu-jitsu. You know, it's like the push-pull is one of the most, it's so basic, but it's a dilemma that governs like 90% of sweeps and reversals in jiu-jitsu. And it's very simple. Like it's simple to understand. If I pull you, uh, sorry, if, yeah, if I pull you, you generally want to push me. Okay. And if I push you, you generally want to pull me. And in doing those two things, it's kind of like the yin and the yang of jujitsu, but like if you do those two things, you end up in a situation where you can play them off of each other and there's always a set of reactions that comes out of it. And when you start learning how to do sumigashi, you start to understand that there are these elements of push and pull and movement, not just your own body movement, but moving your partner around that lead predictably to a set of responses or reactions. You can learn that in the abstract, but when you have something like Sumi, you can really kind of sink your teeth into it as a beginner. For advanced people, I think that the key is, as it is with most things, it's chaining one thing to the other. And when you're learning how to do something as an advanced practitioner, you're often bringing together two different types of uh, approaches. So you're like building a lot more on reactions. And for Sumi, you know, I often will, we cover this in the video, but, you know, working into legs and in particular failed Sumis where you're needing to change your posture, inverting, for instance, um, level changing, uh, heisting up, those sorts of things where you're moving like from uh, like what we would call like one system to another or one subsystem to another. So it's hard to be good at, at sumigashi if you're only doing it in isolation, you know, after a certain point. So really teaching advanced people how to use it, like you were saying, as a hub to chain a, like strengths. How do you go from strength to strength? You know, you can use Kazushi. Maybe your strength is heisting front headlocks going behind. Maybe your strength is leg locks. Maybe your strength is getting deep underneath somebody and pinch headlock. But really being able to kind of link those things together, that's the key. And if you can learn how to do that, then all of a sudden you're, you're maximizing the opportunities that you have when you're working from a position. And that's really what we want people to be able to get. That's excellent. Yeah, your new instructional that just came out, I, I really appreciated the the aspect of failed sumis because that's something that I think a lot of people run into and, and being able to, to, to treat that as its own segment of the sumigashi system, I thought was really brilliant. So for anyone out there that wants to, to that wants to learn this system and wants to improve your butterfly guard, uh, Brian's most recent instructional is called Simplifying the System Sumigashi, and it's available right now at bjjfanatics.com. I'm only a couple chapters in, but it's, it's outstanding so far. I'm really enjoying it thus far. So excellent, Great. excellent work yeah, on Yeah, thank Brian. you. Of course. Brian, what are some of your uh, major goals for 2024? 
Uh, like I was saying, you know, I'm trying to stay away from having goals that are too rigid. Um, I think that we have to, you know, as, as we've been talking about throughout this, uh, this show, uh, we, we want to be flexible, you know, and, and so I'm trying to kind of stay open. I have the same, a lot of the same goals that I've had over the last several years. You know, I really want to make sure that I have a way of continuing to train, to teach, um, to stay in touch with my, my instructor and to be able to continue to help to, uh, to improve, you know, my own jujitsu, but then also the jujitsu of my students and anybody who finds that, uh, you know, Find, finds me to be helpful for them. You know, I want to make sure I'm available to be able to do that. So those are some of my goals. Well, folks, unfortunately, we're fresh out of time. Brian, it is always a great pleasure getting to pick your brain and talk with you, man. I appreciate you being here today for the second time. Uh, you gave some tremendous insight, both for advanced practitioners and beginners. Uh, we really appreciate it. And you're obviously welcome back anytime you'd like to come back on the show. Awesome. Ryan, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, well, let's do it again. I Absolutely. Like I would love to. For anyone out there that wants to keep up with Brian in the meantime, uh, he's active on, on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. So Facebook, it's BZ Glick. Instagram is also BZ Glick. And then his YouTube channel is BZ Glick as well. So BZ Glick yep. for all platforms. If you guys are going to follow him on, on uh, YouTube, make sure you guys subscribe and hit the little bell icon to get notified when he adds new videos. Uh, and then also, guys, again, uh, if you're ever dra traveling through uh, Brooklyn, New York, uh, you try to look him up. He's, he's, he teaches uh, privates. He does seminars. He's, he's always active teaching. So look him up and find out where he's going to be. Uh, also, guys, if you can't make it to Brooklyn, you can learn from Brian anywhere in the world here at BJJFanatics.com. He's got several instructionals. The one we talked about in depth today is his newest one called Simplifying the System, Sumigaishi. So anyone out there wants to get better at the butterfly guard, this is an outstanding choice. And, uh, and that's going to do it for this episode, everybody. I really appreciate you tuning in. Please stay tuned for the next episode of the BJJ Fanatics podcast.